Hi, thank you for visiting us today at, at this morning's webinar. My name is Aaron Hill and I'm the Vice President of Analytics here at Sati Software. Today, we're going to be talking about how to add best worst case two and case three to your research toolbox. We'll talk about ways that you can put these two methods to work for you in your next project. Our objectives today, first thing we want to do is introduce you to best worst case two and three. We'll talk about how to create one of these types of projects in your next pro survey, and then discuss when it's appropriate to use each of these methodologies uh, to answer your research questions. A couple things that we won't cover though, we're not going to cover the various ways that you can fuse different models together. So there's ways that uh, academics and researchers have done to take like a max diff and a CBC and fuse them together into one model. Uh, we're not going to talk about those because it's a little bit more complex than we have time for today. Also, we're not going to talk in depth about the different analysis options you have once you get outside the bounds of SATU software systems. So there's lots of models out there you can use to analyze uh, best worst case two and case three data. We're not going to talk about any outside of just what you can do in SATU software. Okay, so let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about a fictional company called Parana Online Marketplace. And Parana, as you might suspect, is uh, named after the second largest river in Brazil, the largest, of course, being the Amazon. Uh, and Parana wants to figure out how they can compete with the big, huge uh, competitor in this marketplace that will remain unnamed uh, for supremacy in the online market, uh, online shopping market. So we're going to look at how they can get people to buy from them instead of from uh, the big 800 pound gorilla. So in order to scale, the problem is they're not as big as this major online competitor. Uh, so they want to be able to scale the offerings that they provide through incorporating external vendors. So if I can get a company that's already selling a product in market A to sell it through us, then we both benefit because they get additional customers. We get additional scope of products that we can offer. Maybe we can get the products quicker to our customers, things like that. So if we can increase the number of people that are selling through our portal, uh, we can make a lot more money, we can sell a lot more products, we can service the market better. Less inventory, greater selection, we're closer to the end customers, so delivery times are potentially faster, and uh, we're at a lower cost than uh, our competitor, so vendors, if they could sell through us instead of through the other competitor, they'd make more money too. So it's a win-win-win all the way around. So what we want to do in this project is figure out what it is that these vendors can do to get customers to come to them instead of going to the competitor. So we want to know which attributes of the vendors customers pay attention to, what information do we need to give them uh, about the vendor, what information can we leave out. You know, if there's things that the customers just don't care about or they're viewed as negative, then we want to leave them out. If they're positive, so we want to mention them and promote them. We also want to find out what the minimum service level is to be acceptable to be approved as a vendor. So what is it that customers are looking for in terms of delivery time and reliability and the product being what they ordered, things like that, that uh, give the customer confidence in ordering something through our system, but from an outside vendor. So there's a different ways that we could approach this. One of the ways that we could approach it is by doing a traditional CBC study, like the one shown on the screen here, where we take the different attributes that we could uh, vary about our product and we have them choose between bundles of those components. So we'd say, hey, does it have a Piranha seal of approval? Does the vendor offer Piranha Prime, which is the free shipping and, and uh, free uh, movies and stuff? Uh, does it matter where the location is? So is it shipped from a local warehouse or from a regional one or from overseas? Uh, shipping speed, can they guarantee the delivery time for their products? Uh, and then vendor rating, advertising claims, do they actually deliver what they promised, uh, whether it's an authorized reseller or not of the particular product. So if I'm selling a TV, am I not only approved by Parana, but also am I approved by Sony or LG or whoever is actually manufacturing the TV? Uh, and then how do we return the item? So do you have to go through Parana to return it? Do you have to return it directly to the vendor? What, what uh, degree of difficulty do the customers have to go through? So if we were to bundle these things together, we can see which package of those features is most preferred. Uh, but at Parana, one of the things they want to find out is which one or two or three or four of these things 
do we need to show people? So maybe an outlier attribute disappears. Uh, so we need to not only know which of these things are preferred, but inter-attribute, how are these preferences arranged? And so a CBC doesn't quite get to what we need because what we really need to know is which one's better, having a par on a seal of approval or having par on a prime. And maybe we don't even show the seal of approval or par on a prime if it, if it doesn't make a difference to customers. So the second way that we could look at that is we could do this as a max diff. So uh, let's look at the, the pros and cons of CBC. The pros are we can measure the additive value of a full vendor offering. So we can look at each thing and say, okay, how much additional value does that thing uh, offer? We can easily estimate the interactions between these things. So for instance, we've got a location attribute and a returns attribute. And maybe it's easier for me to return things if I have to return directly to the vendor. Maybe it's easier if it's a local company than if it's an overseas company because I have to pay overseas shipping. Uh, you can also measure the none. So there's some things that we like about CBC and maybe that would work for our situation here. Uh, but there's a couple cons. One is that we can't directly compare the utility value of one attribute versus the utility value of another attribute. Uh, we can, it's also a relatively difficult task for respondents because they've got to look at all of the information across all of those products. So a couple things we don't like. It's not a terribly difficult task, but it's more difficult than, say, a max diff exercise might be. So let's look at the other alternative we have, which is doing it as a max diff. So if we did this as a max diff, we'd change the question a little bit. So we'd take the 23 items that were in our original CBC and we just treat them as individual things. So instead of asking people to rate the whole concept, we'd say, hey, here's some things that might make you choose one vendor over another thing. And we'd say, hey, which one makes you most likely to use this external vendor? Which one makes you least likely to use an external vendor? And so they'd go through and they'd say, okay, well, with these five items, and they might be within the same attribute or across different attributes, uh, MaxDiff isn't aware of attributes, so these things are just gonna vary independently. Uh, and so they're going to say, hey, which of these things makes you most likely and which makes you least likely to use an external vendor? And so with this question, they're going to be asked to choose between returned items must be shipped back to the vendor, products are usually close to as advertised, vendor is not authorized, a not an authorized reseller of your product, no piranha seal of approval, or shipping speed is not guaranteed. So I'd look at that and say, okay, well, the best thing about this is that the product is usually close to as advertised, and maybe the worst thing about this is that... Uh, retired items must be shipped back to the vendor. I can't return it the usual way that I return Prana items. Okay, so this also has some pros and cons. It's got some things we like, some things we don't like. So with a regular standard max diff, we've got the pros that we can directly compare utility values of one level within the, our study with a utility value of another attribute. And so again, max diff doesn't care about attributes, so all these things are treated as individual components. And so we're just saying, hey, assuming all these individual components are on the same scale, tell me which one's the most preferred and which one's the least preferred. There are no attributes. There's no inter-attribute range differences that we need to worry about. So we're just going to be able to say, hey, this thing's the best thing. This thing's the next best thing. This thing's the next best thing. And maybe the first two come from attribute one and the second one comes from attribute three and the next one comes with, from attribute five. All right. So a couple other things we like about it. Uh, Max diff is relatively easy task for the respondent. They're going to look at this list and they only have to look at five things where before they were looking at eight things across three different concepts. So they just have to look at five things and make judgments of which one's the best and which one's the worst. But there are a couple cons to max diff. So uh, one is that we're not measuring the additive value of the full vendor offering. We can't say what happens if it has free shipping and it's located locally. Right. All we're going to know is that free shipping is the most preferred thing and, and available locally might be the third most uh, preferred thing. We also can't easily estimate interactions between things because things were chosen one at a time. Uh, it makes it harder to estimate interactions between attributes like location and returns because we're not asking people to consider them jointly. We're not saying what happens if a location is local and a return is direct to the vendor. We're saying these two things are independent of one another, which one makes you more or less likely to choose the vendor? So even if we could estimate interactions, it doesn't quite make sense given the, the way that we're asking the question. You also can't measure a none option because we're not looking at the full profile. We can't say, hey, how likely are you to walk out the door without buying anything? 
you know, how much better to, to shop from our competitor or, or not purchase because it wasn't available on Aparna. Uh, we also are missing potentially important context. So again, sometimes these attributes that we have uh, have an impact on one another. So if I don't know where the vendor is, maybe I can't judge how important the, the return level is, right? If I have to return it, again, if I have to return it directly to Prarana, then I care less about where the, the product came from because they are responsible for getting it back to the vendor. Whereas if I have to return it to the vendor, then I care about where they are because now I have to pay the shipping cost back to the vendor. So uh, potentially, they won't be able to make judgments on these things because we didn't give them the context that you get out of a CDC. So, uh, and, and Max Diff, again, with this context, sometimes we get situations where maybe we're showing things that are completely contradictory. So uh, in this particular case, I only had to go through 13 tasks to find one where it had shipping goods being shipped from a local warehouse and from overseas and they have the seal of approval and don't have the seal of approval. So clearly, because these types of things are going to come up, uh, you know, I might not be able to, to look at the shipping speed very accurately because I don't know whether it's the local warehouse or the overseas that I'm supposed to judge it against. And also, you know, it, it's clear that these are separate things because now I'm showing things that conflict with one another. Therefore, we can't be talking about one vendor that has all of these. We're talking about different vendors that have different things, right? So. So the context matters uh, quite a bit in these things. So, uh, so we've got kind of two extremes here. We've got CBC on one end where we're showing the profiles and we're asking them to choose which one's the best. And we get this nice additive model that says, if you have this and this and this and this and this, then I can tell you how likely they are to buy from you. Uh, but I can't judge the things independently of one another. So I can't say thing one of attribute A is better than thing three of attribute D because they were measured relative to an omitted level in the attribute matrix and stuff. So it just doesn't make sense. Uh, on the other hand, we've got max diff, which is nice because it solves that problem, but we also aren't showing things full profile. We don't get to see the context around these things. Uh, and, and respondents are having to make decisions that, that may inform us about which one thing is best, but I also can't see how they interact with one another. So it'd be kind of nice if we had some methods that are in between those two methods. And so uh, max diff uh, is good, CBC is good. They're both good for a lot of different situations, but there is kind of a middle ground. So we're gonna talk about the two methods that are kind of in between these other methods that are used so heavily. So max diff best worst uh, is called best worst case one. It's also called the object case because we're treating each of the levels as a separate object. So when we're answering a max diff, each one is independent of every other one, and we're just looking at which object is the best thing from that list of five things. Here's the best thing, here's the worst thing, and we're gonna use that to build a model that says how likely was this thing independent of everything else to be chosen as the best thing. Uh, so it's called best worst case one. But there's also a best worst case two, called the profile case, where it's very similar to a max diff, but instead of showing things randomly on the screen, or, you know, carefully controlled, but still looking random to the respondent, we're actually gonna show a full profile and we're gonna rotate things in, in attributes. So we're gonna show one level of each attribute, but it, behind the scenes, we're still measuring it like a max diff. So we do get the context, but we're, all the models are still gonna be back to max diff where we're saying, okay, we're just measuring the value of each thing independently. So each thing is still an object, but we're gonna set it up so it shows it as a profile. So we're not gonna see two shipping things. We're not gonna see two return policies. We're gonna see one return policy, one shipping policy. And we're gonna say, what, uh, consider this vendor profile. What's the best thing about this vendor? What's the worst thing about this vendor? So that's a uh, best worst case too. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The third thing, uh, I'm sorry, let me, let me go back to best worst case too. So here's an example of what our study might look like. So we're gonna show uh, different tasks where we say which feature makes you most likely to choose this vendor, which one makes you least likely to choose this vendor. We've got, again, one return, one advertising claim, one authorized reseller claim. Uh, and essentially, we're showing it like a CBC concept, but we're asking them which feature within that concept is the best and which one's the worst, okay? All right, the other thing is uh, called best worst case three. And best worst case three is called multi-profile case because we're gonna show it, it's more similar to a CBC, 
Uh, but it's going to take advantage of the fact that we're getting a best answer and a worst answer so we get more rich data, but in the CBC profile instead. And this one is going to look just like a CBC task, except for that at the end, instead of just asking for their best, we're going to add a row and we're going to say, yeah, and also tell us which one's the worst thing. Um, and this also adds advantages and disadvantages, and we'll talk about those here in a second. All right, so let's talk about case two, the profile case. Again, this is the one we're going to show one concept, and we're going to say, what's the best thing about this vendor and what's the worst thing about this vendor? Uh, this is useful in situations where the context may change the value of the item. So again, you know, if we've got the shipping uh, and where, you know, where it's coming from and where it has to be returned to, those may interact with one another. So the context of the one made it, might uh, determine the value of the other. Uh, so anytime where the profile matters, uh, we may want to consider doing this as a best worst case too. A lot of times we see this in healthcare where you're looking at, you know, which nursing home is the best for your, your parents or uh, which treatment method is best. And you don't want to have them choose between treatments. You just want to know what's the best thing and what's the worst thing about that treatment uh, option that they have. Uh, it's easy for a response to grasp what we're asking and make consistent judgments. So it's a little bit better. Sometimes people get confused on a max diff because the context is missing. Uh, it also allows you to compare across attributes just like with max diff, but the product is shown as pro full profile. Okay, so we get the benefits of the profile, but we're measuring things in terms of max diff where we get an individual value for each item. These things are scaled in relation to one another so we can tell, hey, that combination of things is the best, I mean, sorry, that, that individual item is the best thing, so maybe this shipping method is the best, and then that returns method is the second best, and then the seal of approval is the third best, so we can look at things across attributes, which you can't do in conjoint. Uh, but it's still not an additive model. Uh, it still also doesn't, out of the box, support interaction effects. Okay. All right, so how do we set this up? The way we set this up is we create, essentially, uh, a max diff in Lighthouse Studio, but then we're going to put in prohibitions to make sure that, that things within an attribute don't show up together. And then we're going to bump up the number of uh, items that we're showing in a task so that the number of items matches the number of attributes. Uh, so in, in this case here, you know, if attribute one, level one, and two, and three, this is all going to be one big list in Lighthouse Studio that's going to feed into a max diff, but we're going to go put in prohibitions so that attribute one, level one, can't show up with attribute one, level two, or attribute one, level three, but it can show up with any of the levels of attribute two, or attribute three, or attribute four, right? So we're going to create this as if it's one big list of things, so essentially one attribute, but then in the prohibitions, we're going to define our attributes by putting in prohibitions so that no one level of an attribute can show up with any one other level of that attribute. Okay, let's go into the software and we'll show you how this is done. So I've got a survey open here where I've pre-set up a CBC study and a max diff study. And what we're going to do is we're going to, for, for best worst case two, we're going to open up this max diff study. And uh, initially I've got this set up as a best worst case one, where it's just a standard max diff. I've got my question text where we ask them how, which makes them most likely or least likely to choose an alternate vendor. We've got our items where we just have, it has the Piranha seal of approval or no Piranha seal of approval, et cetera. Uh, if I go to format, I'm showing the best items and the worst items. And uh, typically we, in this type of case, we'd show five items per set, four or five items. And with 23 items and five items per set, uh, the recommendation is that we'd ask 14 to 23 choice tasks. So we're going to stick with 14 here and let's preview what that looks like. This is what we would be showing to the respondent. They'd say Prana offers products from its own inventory, but also provides you access to third party vendors. Suppose you want to order a product through Piranha, but Piranha does not have the product in its inventory. Instead, it's available through a number of external Piranha approved vendors. Which feature makes you most likely to use an approved alternate vendor and which makes you least likely to use an alternate vendor? And they come in and they say, okay, well, between these five things, uh, maybe this one's the most likely, this one's least likely. So they choose it and then uh, we get the results out just like a, a, a standard max dip. Okay. So if we want to set this up, though, as a best worst case two, we need to set things up just a little differently. So uh, the first thing I'm going to want to do is right now my items, they, they don't have labels. And so maybe what I'd want to do is put in attribute labels so it looks more like a CBC. So I'm going to switch this and instead of using this list, I'm going to use a, 
a different list where I've gone in and said, okay, well, I want to show, if I preview this really quick, I want to actually show the, uh, the attribute label here and then the level text, okay? Uh, so within an attribute, I've got the, the same attribute label, but then I've got different level text here. I've got the attribute label bolded. So we've got Piranha Seal of Approval, yes. Piranha Seal of Approval, no. Piranha Prime, yes. Piranha Prime, no. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is just change the label so that it looks more like a, a CBC type exercise. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the, the Format tab. Actually, no, I don't need to worry about the Format tab, but I'm going to go to the Design tab. And uh, in this case, I've actually got eight attributes in my study. So uh, I'm going to go in here and say, hey, instead of showing five things at a time, let's show eight things at a time. Actually, maybe seven. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but then I'm also going to go down here and put in some prohibitions. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Whoops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Yeah, okay, eight attributes. Okay, so I'm going to put in prohibitions so that within an attribute, things can't occur at the same time on the same max diff exercise. So for Piranha Seal of Approval, I'm going to select that as my prohibit item. Piranha Seal of Approval, yes. And I want to make sure that it doesn't occur with Piranha Seal of Approval, no. Okay, so I put in one prohibition for a two item uh, attribute. Uh, do the same thing here, Piranha Prime, yes. Can't occur with Piranha Prime, no. If I look at Piranha Prime, no, It'll already show that it was prohibited from Piranha Prime, yes, because they're just inverses of one another. Uh, location, I'm going to have to put in uh, more prohibitions because I need to prohibit one from occurring with two and three, and then two from occurring with three. So we're going to go into location, and I'm going to put in two prohibitions there with the other levels of location. If I go to the second one, it's already prohibited with the first one, but I still have to prohibit it from the third one. And then, by definition, the third one's already prohibited from the first two. So all right, and then shipping speed, we're going to do the same thing. Shipping speed, we're going to prohibit from its other levels. Second item, we're going to prohibit from the third one, and then the third one's already covered. Vendor rating, we've got to put in more prohibitions. So I've got to put in four for the first one, three for the second one, two for the third one, and one for the fourth one for the vendor ratings. Uh, advertising claims, I'm going to put in two prohibitions for the first one one prohibition for the second one, and the third one's already taken care of. Authorized reseller, we just have two levels of that, so one prohibition is needed. Returns, two for the first one, one for the second one, and we're done. So each of our items is going to have prohibitions so that they can't occur with any of the other levels within that attribute. Okay? All right. So we're going to click OK here. It's going to say, hey, we need to generate a new design. We've got 25 prohibitions. We're going to click on Generate Design. And uh, it's going to come back and say, hey, preliminary research suggests that displaying more than six items per set may not be optimal. Uh, in this case, uh, because we're talking about attributes, uh, we, we think it's okay. You could potentially, though, set it up so it would be partial profile. And the way you do that is just drop the number of items per set. And then it'll rotate in the attributes uh, randomly so that so the design filled out each of the levels equally. Okay. We're going to ignore the warning here. We're going to click on Generate Design. And uh, you're going to notice a couple things about the design that are different than normal Max Diff. So most of the time, when Max Diff runs the design, it's going to look and make sure that each level occurs an equal number of times to every other level. Well, in this one, we've prohibited things in uneven ways, so it's not possible for the designer to make each of the levels occur an equal number of times because we've got eight slots, but we've made prohibitions so that I can't put in the, the five level attributes more often than the two level attributes because they can't occur more than once in a task, right? Again, if you do like five items at a time, then we're going to be partial profile. We won't show all the attributes, uh, but you could, it, it will more evenly uh, fill out the design matrix, but you'll have, you know, the five level rating attribute occur more often than the two level attributes. Okay. So in this case, what we're looking for is, is it even within the attributes? So, our, our two first two levels are the first attribute, and those occur exactly evenly. The second two are our second attribute, and those occur evenly, etc. So it looks like we've got a balanced, as balanced a design as it can make, um, given the prohibitions that we put in place. Now, in here, in the two-way frequencies, we should see zeros 
between the levels that we told were part of the same attribute. So we've got a zero here, a zero here. Those should correspond with our prohibitions. Uh, you probably would not want to put in prohibitions other than the ones that you need to put in the attributes. Um, so just be careful about that because it'll cause uh, much bigger imbalances. Okay. So uh, we look across this and we can see that our zeros are where they need to be. Everything else is fairly even within an attribute by attribute uh, comparison. And then if you look at the positional frequencies, uh, it actually controlled for positional frequency. This is one situation where you might not want to control for positional frequency. We'll talk about that in a couple seconds. So the, the default would be to show the attributes in random order and it actually tries to show them in random order so that Attribute 1 shows up at the top as often as it shows up at the bottom, uh, but that may actually confuse respondents because then they've got to hunt across the attributes. So uh, currently there's not a way to, to unwind that, but uh, I'll talk in a second. So, uh, so that's how you set it up. That's, that's it. You just put in the prohibitions, you uh, change the number of items per set, and then uh, we've got to put in uh, maybe some attribute label changes, and maybe you change the way you ask the question so that it's clear that we're talking about one vendor that they're choosing the best and the worst, rather than what's the best feature of a vendor, right? So if we preview this thing now, we should see that uh, we've got one level of authorized reseller, one level of location, one level of vendor rating. And so they're going to look across this and considering all of this as one, ad, one, one uh, vendor, which one's the most important and which one's the least important to them. Okay. Note that we're not asking them whether they would buy from this vendor. We're just asking them which thing is the most important and which one is the least important. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's uh, the setup on a best worst case too. As far as analysis goes, there's a lot of different ways that you can analyze this data. So if you look in the literature, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can structure the data. You can actually separate out the attribute impact from the level impacts. Uh, there's, there's just different ways to code things, to put emphasis on, on different things, depending on how we collected the data. Uh, within SAW2 software's suite of product, within Lighthouse Studio, uh, we, the only way that we offer you is uh, within the software using the tools that we already have for MaxDiff. So um, let's uh, go back to the slides here for a second, make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, so we talked about the demonstration. Uh, there's a couple issues that you also need to worry about when setting up the study. Uh, Connectivity is a, typically a big issue within uh, MaxDiff exercises. We want to make sure that each item occurs with every other item, uh, either, either directly compared against each other or directly compared against something else that was compared against it. So I may never compare A to C, but if I've compared A to B and B to C, then I can infer the relationship between A and C. If I compare A, B, and C together and D, E, and F together, but I never compare A, B, and C to D, E, or F, then I can't tell how D, E, and F fit into A, B, and C. So connectivity is an issue. Within an attribute, we don't have connectivity. So levels one, level two were part of the same attribute, and I never compared them together. But I did compare level one with a bunch of other things and level two with a bunch of other things. So I still can make that connection to say level one is preferred over level three and level four, and then level two is after that. So I do get the connection across attributes not within an attribute, but it turns out that it, it doesn't matter if we're using the max diff analysis engine to, to uh, uh, evaluate that. How many questions you ask? Uh, I'd recommend that you follow the standard max diff guidelines. We typically want each item to occur three to five times within a, a choice set. Uh, so whatever the max diff guidelines are that gives you that uh, will work. So in this case, uh, we actually had one attribute with five levels. And so if we want that to occur three times, then showing 14 tasks like the default was wouldn't actually work for that because we're not showing that, we're not giving it enough spots. So if you take the number of tasks that you have times the number of, uh, and you divide it by the number of levels in your biggest attribute, that should tell you, uh, it, you know, we want that to be three to five typically. So if you take the number of levels in your biggest attribute, multiply it by the number of uh, times you want each item to appear, that'll give you the number of tasks. So if you have five items in your biggest attribute times three, that'll give you 15 choice tasks. So that'd probably be the minimum that we'd want in this type of exercise. Uh, checking prohibitions, you should have n minus one prohibitions for each item. So if I've got three, uh, 
items in my attribute, I should have uh, two prohibitions for each item, right? So not two prohibitions total within the attribute, two prohibitions between each item. Uh, again, double check to make sure that you don't have additional prohibitions beyond those needed. Uh, double check also that you've made sure that you prohibited each item from occurring with every other item. Uh, sometimes I've, I've uh, seen exercises where I've forgotten one or two and we've caught it in testing, but we need to make sure that that happens. Uh, order of the attributes, Maxiv will randomize the order of the attributes within a respondent. So the order that they see the second task will be different than the task uh, number one. So if you want to reorder them, you would need to export the design out, uh, reorder them in Excel, uh, sorting them uh, lowest to highest, uh, and then import it back in. So that's the only way right now that you can get uh, the uh, design sorted in the right order if you want to control the order of the items. Uh, partial profile, again, if you want to do a partial profile where you're showing some of the attributes but not all of the attributes, again, you can just decrease the number of items that you're showing per task, and that will naturally create a partial profile design. Okay, uh, when is it best to use? Uh, we've seen it used a lot in healthcare outcomes research. So again, if you're doing research on uh, nursing homes or treatment plans or those types of things, uh, a situation where the objective is to find the value of individual components, not the product bundle. So in this case, uh, the overriding thing that, that, uh, that Parana is trying to find is what's the value of each individual component? Uh, it'd be nice if we could sort of have it kind of be like a CVC, but we don't need that to answer the questions that we have. Uh, it, it also works very well for service offerings. Uh, and it sometimes can be kind of a quick and dirty alternative to a CVC type exercise. So you can do a max diff, it makes it a little easier for the respondents. Uh, and uh, we find that there's some situations where it just works better. Okay, again, a couple other suggestions for creating the survey. Double check your prohibitions. Be cautious when attributes have different numbers of levels. It may make it so that you want to change uh, how many questions you're asking, how many uh, levels per task. Uh, you also want to increase your attribute level labels, or I'm sorry, include your attribute labels in each of the fields. So if I just said yes, no uh, for uh, Parana Prime, it wouldn't, the, the respondent wouldn't even know what I was talking about. So you need to make sure that those level labels are in there. Uh, don't forget to change your questionnaire wording. Be specific in describing the scenario you want them to imagine and make sure that you change your labels to match the scenario you put them in. So in this case, we're asking, hey, consider these things, tell me what's the best thing about this particular vendor, what's the worst thing about this particular vendor, whereas in a max diff, we would have said, tell us what's the best you know, vendor feature, what's the worst vendor feature, maybe we're talking about different vendors. Uh, and then lastly, test your questionnaire, both for statistical efficiency, you want to make sure that, that you're getting the, the precision that you need, but also for the respondent experience. Make sure that it makes sense, make sure that the questions ask what you actually want them to ask, uh, you know, there's a big difference sometimes between asking them which would make you most likely to buy from them versus which one would you prefer. Um, so uh, consider those things as well. Okay, as far as analysis goes, uh, within software, Sawtooth software, the analysis can be done with the tools that are already included for MaxDiff. So you can run this, you can use the counts analysis, you can use HB, you can use latent class analysis, multinomial logia, et cetera. Uh, and you can analyze this just like you would a standard max diff. Uh, do beware, like when you're looking at counts, that the number of times each item occurs is going to be different. So if you're looking at the raw counts, uh, the, the base number of times that they could have chosen it is going to be different for each of the attributes. So uh, you may have to adjust your thinking for that. The counts are still right. You know, the proportional counts are still going to be right. But, uh, you know, something that was chosen 200 times might actually be better than something that was chosen 100 times if it was available half as often, right? So uh, do keep that in mind. Results can be compared across attribute levels. So in CBC, it wouldn't be appropriate to say, hey, Parana Prime, yes, has a higher utility than uh, you know, local, you know, being shipped from a local seller. Uh, it could be that they hate all of the, the options. It could be that, that I don't care whether it has Amazon Prime or you know, whatever. So, uh, you have to look at those and, and within conduit analysis, you can't compare one level of one attribute with one level of another attribute. But in this world, you can. You can look at the utilities and say, okay, well, this one's got a higher utility. Therefore, it had a higher probability of being the best thing than something that had a lower utility. 
there's not an ability to specify interaction effects. So if you want interaction effects, you may need to recode your data and estimate it elsewhere. Uh, it, whether it's an additive model, uh, technically this is not an additive model. We're not assuming that you can add these things together and treat it like a conjoint. Uh, so I can't export the raw utilities and then say, okay, if it has Amazon, uh, uh, Power on a Prime and if they're an approved vendor and if they're an authorized reseller of my product and blah, 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 how does that compare to another product profile? Because we never ask them to do that. However, there's a lot of evidence that says that it might work. So we've done some research here at Sawtooth Software. Uh, we've run, run robotic respondents through exercises and we found that that it doesn't work as well with, with, with realistic, uh, with, with actual respondents taking the survey, we found that it doesn't work quite as well as, as actual CBC does when you're comparing, you know, hit rates of, of holdout CBC tasks. However, there's other research that other uh, academics have done over the years that have shown that in some situations it does work out fairly well. So it could be that it works out well in some, some contexts and not others. We're not quite sure. The jury's still out. Uh, but there is some evidence that maybe you could actually use it as a, as a proxy for an actual conjoint exercise. Maybe we can take these scores out and add them together and have something that's close enough to what you get out of an actual additive conjoint model that it works well enough for, for some purposes. Okay. Uh, if you want to do one of these other methods, uh, there's a lot of literature out there that talks about different ways that you can analyze case 2 data. Uh, there's numerous coding schemes where you can where you can separate out the effects. You can do dummy coding and effects coding, and you can code the attributes uh, separate from the levels. You can drop different reference levels uh, to get different types of models out. Again, I'm not going to talk about those different types of models. Just know that they're out there. Uh, if you want to find out more information about them, uh, a good place to start, there's an R package called support.bws2. Uh, and there's a great technical paper that's included with that. Um, and, and you can use that to take data out of like our max diff and plug it in there and it will take it and recode it and uh, spit out recoded files that you could then take and potentially run through uh, a, the HB software or other uh, estimation techniques. So those are available. If you want to take the time to do them, uh, there's some tools that, that make some of the tasks uh, fairly easy to do. Uh, also, we've done some research at Sawtooth Software about ways that you can combine, combine what you get out of a best worst case two type exercise with uh, other types of choice data. So you could take a best worst case two where you say, what's the best feature of this vendor? What's the worst feature of this vendor? And then you could have a follow-up question where you ask, and would you actually buy from this vendor? Now we've got a choice task between buying from them and not buying from them. Uh, or we could ask a CBC type exercise later where we show multiple profiles and said, which one would you buy from? And if we recode those two so they're in a common format, we could actually build a model that has both the max diff exercise data and the CBC data, and we can merge those together. Again, we're not gonna talk about the specifics of that. Uh, there are papers out there that can tell you how to do that type of recoding and, and analysis. Okay, so that's best worst case two. Let's talk a little bit about best worst case three. This one's a little bit easier to talk about. Uh, it's a fairly easy add to a CBC study. So best worst case three, it's identical to a CBC. We're just gonna add an additional question at the bottom where we say, and what's the worst uh, of these product concepts? So the nice thing about this is uh, we get the, the good information that we get out of a CBC as far as what the additive model looks like. Uh, it's more efficient than a standard CBC because now you know, with a regular CBC, if I show three concepts and I ask them for the best, I know that A was better than B and A was better than C. If I ask it an additional question and say, okay, and what was the worst one? Now I know the relationship between B and C as well. So I can add additional pieces of information by asking about that worst. It doesn't take the respondent much more time, uh, but it gives me more rich data. So if you're in a situation where maybe you want to do a CBC, but you like the max diff framework, uh, and you like the fact that you get more data out of it if you include that worst, uh, maybe you don't have a lot of respondents in your study or you have an abbreviated time frame, so you can only afford to ask them five or six uh, choice tasks. Uh, you know, this is an additional way that we can get a little bit of extra data with not a lot of work for the respondent. 
Uh, it also helps out because sometimes the goal of our research isn't necessarily to find the best option. The goal of our research is to, to find a good option while avoiding bad options. So if we ask about the worst, we do get slightly different types of data out of, out of it because people's thought processes on avoiding a bad outcome are a little bit different than getting a good outcome. So they may think about things differently. And this is a positive and a negative. Uh, if our model is to kind of find a sweet spot where you know, we're trying to get as good as we can, but we also maybe have to include some bad features, having that worst answer can help us get more data about the bad end of the scale. Uh, a couple other drawbacks. So this is a positive and a negative. It helps inform us about the worst end of the scale, but it also is sort of a negative because it, they, people do use slightly different processes for those two answers. So it could bias your model a little bit by combining those two types of answers. Uh, you know, when we estimate the model, we're going to assume that in the negative answer, when they select the worst, it's just the inverse of when they select the best. And that may not be true. They may be different, fundamentally different models. Uh, it also takes a little bit more time. There's, there's a little bit more thought that goes into answering that worst option. Um, so there are a couple drawbacks to, to doing it this way. Uh, how to set it up? This is actually pretty easy to set up. Uh, there's a lot less work than, than setting up a best worst case too, because all we have to do is check a box that says, hey, ask the worst also. So let me go back to that study that we were looking at a couple minutes ago, and we're going to click the box to make the magic happen. So in this case, uh, the, the question that we're asking the respondents, which of these vendors would you likely choose instead? And we'd probably want to change that text to be something like, which of these vendors is the best? and which is the worst option to purchase your product. Uh, to set that up, all we have to do is go to the Format tab and say, hey, instead of asking discrete choice, we're asking just for the select the best, we're going to change it to best worst choice, and we're going to ask them to select the best and select the worst. And you can change those labels if you need to, but that's essentially all the setup you have to do. There's nothing about the design that needs to change because we're not changing the design itself. We're just asking that additional task. So. Again, we're just asking for the best thing and we're asking for the worst thing. Okay, as far as analysis goes, actually again, there's probably a slide here coming up uh, where we talk about uh, some setup issues. Give me a second here. All right, let's go back to the slides. All right, when, when to use this, it applies in almost any situation where you use a normal CBC, uh, but it particularly applies to situations where you need the information on, on the downside of, of producing a bad product also uh, works uh, good. Like I said, uh, if you need an additional little bit of information to help get more stable utility estimates. Uh, as far as analysis goes, within Sawtooth software, best and worst answers are supported by all the utility estimation techniques. So again, you can use HB, you can use latent class, you can use aggregate logit, et cetera. You can tell the software which one you want to use. So I can estimate the model with the best answers alone. I can estimate the model with the best and worst. I can use just the worst answers. So uh, all three of those are supported. So it's, it's really simple to just uh, run the utilities like I would. So I can always include the worst question. And as long as I don't think it's, as long as I don't think it's changing people's thinking about how they answer, I can include both the best and the worst, and then just estimate the best if I, I think, oh, well, maybe the worst will bias my answers. And I always just choose the best. And then I get the identical model to what I would have gotten if I had just run a regular CBC. Uh, all the analysis options are available. So again, you can get interaction effects, you can do linear terms, you can do all of those things uh, with the best and worst, because all we're doing is adding an additional uh, data point and flipping the scale of how we're coding the uh, independent variables. Okay. All right, so in conclusion, uh, we've shown you two different ways that you can uh, create models that are kind of in between our standard max diff model and our, our typical CBC model. Uh, and you can, you can use those in situations where uh, it makes sense. So best worst case two is useful in situations where max diff scores are desired, but we want to show the product full profile. Best worst case three is, is useful in situations where we want more of a CBC type model, but we want to take advantage of the benefits that the max diff type thinking provides, the, the increased data that we get out of asking for that worst option as well. Uh, both methods, again, can be used directly in our Lighthouse Studio software very easily within the, the infrastructure that we already give you uh, without having to change much about what you're doing 
to create your surveys or analyze the data. Uh, at this point, uh, we typically open it up for question and answers. Uh, final notes, uh, we've got uh, some different uh, papers that are available that you could look at. Um, the next uh, webinar will be which conjoint method should I use? It will be taught by me on July 30th of 2020. Um, and then if you want to look for papers that talk about these methods, uh, I've included a couple select papers uh, that, are, that are, I found useful in preparing for this. Uh, in particular, I want to point out uh, a couple of them. Um, there's the Totologu paper uh, that's uh, very good at describing the, the three different types of uh, methods that are available. The R package paper is really good at, at telling how to code these types of methods. Uh, and then there's a good paper that Brian Orm here at Sawtree Software wrote uh, where, we've, where it goes over the research that we've done to talk about the methods and, and the combining of methods that you might want to do uh, if you want to get a little bit more advanced in this. So uh, that's it. Thank you again for attending the workshop. Uh, if you have questions about any of this, please feel free to reach out to us here at Sawtooth Software. And uh, we hope you enjoy uh, working on your next project using Best Worst Case 2 or Case 3.